Welcome into a very special Unbreakable, a mental health podcast with Jay Glazer. I'm Jay Glazer, and this is the most special guest I've ever had on in my entire life. And before I get to her, just a quick word here from our title sponsor, Carolyn. If you're like many people, you may be surprised to learn that one in five adults in this country experienced mental illness last year, yet far too many fell to receive the support they need. Carolyn Behavioral Health is doing something about it. They understand that behavioral health is a key part of whole health, delivering compassionate care that treats physical, mental, emotional, and social needs in tandem. Carolyn Behavioral Health, raising the quality of life through empathy and action. All right, our guest for these next two weeks, because we're going to do a two-parter because it's the holiday time. And the way this came about is wonderful people over at Fox Sports Radio. Uh, And a lot of people out there have said, man, we have never seen you better. We've never seen a better version of Jay Glazer. And I said, well, Rosie's really the reason why. My beautiful fiance, Rosie Tennyson, she's why. And, you know, I finally, after all these years, found a partner who could really lift me up. And I feel comfortable and safe for the first time in my life. And they said, great, let's get Rosie on. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not getting Rosie on. Absolutely not. And they said, do you know how many people you could hope, help and give hope to if the two of you came on and just talked about not only Rosie's life, which is unbelievable. Like for she's the reality show of all reality shows and the success story of success stories uh, for all little girls out there trying to make it. And, but also just the hope that we can give people that it's never too late to find love and also to give people insight into what she does to help me when my crazy gets out of control, when my gray gets really dark and deep, what she does to help lift me up and to be there for me. So I am this better version. So this is for Don and Scott and Maury (laughs) and Justin and everybody else out there who has said this is the best version of Jay Glazer they've seen. Everybody, welcome my beautiful fiance, Rosie Tennyson. Oh, thank you, babe. <laughs> That's quite the introduction. <laughs> it is quite the introduction. And move thank up to you, Rosie. Thank you. So, thank you so much. It, now, here's what we're going to do here, right? We are going to go into Rosie's story. Then we're going to go into our story. And then we're going to go into a lot of the things that Rosie's done to help me. But I know this, before we do that, we'll we'll leave them with one good, I think, lesson here because it's the holiday times and holiday times can get really difficult for a lot of people. So for everyone out there, for your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your child or whatever it is, I think a good lesson we could start off with is, you know, I, I posted something a few weeks ago that I was really struggling and I was really in a dark place. And what I tend to do, folks, my whole life, and I did this with Rosie, (laughs) is I, because I never felt worthy of this kind of love that Rosie has with me, I have always tended to sabotage, to push everyone away, because the pain of knowing it's going to go away and end is worse than it actually ending. The fear of it ending is more painful for me than it ending. So I speed up that end. You like to sabotage. I like to sabotage. I like to do things to make sure it goes away. And I've done that with Rosie. And I sometimes continually do it with Rosie. And the last time I did that to you, your answer to me was what? I'm not, well, you were, of course, like kind of, you know, having like, feeling a certain kind of way but i was just, no, no, I, I was in a really yeah, great in a dark great place. dark place it was every the world was falling it was just, everything was like you know feeling really bad and um i just told you i'm hey look i'm not going anywhere no matter what what happens here how you're feeling i'm i'm going to be here for you because i i knew you were like just thinking the worst thoughts but i was assuring you that you know what it's just i'm not going anywhere cuz then that immediately put you at ease but you also and, convinced me of it where- yeah Other people may say it. So like convince your partner, like as bad as you may, may feel right now, I'm not going anywhere. I promise you. And that was the other thing. You made a promise. I made a promise. promise. I'm not going anywhere. And I said, I had your back and I wasn't going anywhere. And you immediately like was like, oh, oh, okay. And it like calmed you down. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to go 
from there. But I think when someone's like feeling that way and you're feeling like, like, you know, someone's going to bolt, you're like in one of those moods, the worst thing you could do is like pull away because right. then it's only going to make the person feel more like yeah, validate my feelings. validate your right. feelings and then more worried. And then it just keeps spiraling. But the best thing you could do is just reassure them and have their back, which that's what I always try and do when, when that happens. And the other great thing you did was when we do this, a lot of times we feel so ashamed that we do this. Yeah. And Rosie <laughs> then assured me in like 10 minutes, like, Oh, I'm, I'm over it. I'm done. Like we're fine. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Right. You were beating yourself up. Like he beats himself up over this stuff. And I'm like, literally like, I'm like, don't, don't like, I, I, I give him forgiveness and I get over it quick. I don't, I'm not holding a grudge. I'm not bringing it up. I'm not, I'm like, Hey, like it's, you realize it's my own pain. And yeah. I don't mean it. Yeah. Right. No, I know. And also too, I don't want you beat yourself up way more than I do. Even if it's something that, in, you know, so like, I think sometimes you get in that, that rut. But I'm like, hey, man, let's let's forget about it. let's go on a walk. Let's go. Let's go to the beach or let's go do just break up the I try and break up the um, the, the cycle, the cycle, which is really a great thing to do, because then all of a sudden, instead of like one day it was happening and you I was like, hey, let's go to Cross Creek and take the dogs or whatever. And then immediately, like within like 20 minutes, like we were fine and everything was right. good. But it what you can you can either go further into it or you can do something that breaks up the. Right. the the pattern and then it just we had a great day right so instead of just telling me hey i got your back i'm not going anywhere she didn't just walk away she then said let's go do something Let, let's go like she she proved to me she wasn't going anywhere yeah and that that's a lifesaver it's and a you were throwing a changer. pity party you were like at a little pity party over there. Was a major pity party <laughs> pity no party. doubt right and i was like hey man this pity party is you know you could stay in it but i'm not i was like i'm actually gonna go to the the cross creek and let's let's and you're go. coming with me you're coming right. with me and let's break this pity party up and let's go do something like like to get your mind off right. it. i said and if you want to talk about the problem when we get back we can talk about it later but you didn't even care, like like the yeah. thing that had happened. I remember what it was, but by then we just had like right. moved on, and it and, was just and a really good a good thing to do when someone's like feeling that way. But the other thing she did that night because the shame doesn't go away, and she realized it about me. So she gave me extra hugs that night. She gave me extra love that night. She really went above and beyond to show me she's not harboring any of these ill feelings. Because you start thinking to yourself, oh, they're just acting like everything's good, but then they're gonna leave. And she's going to use this against me. Right. She's going to yeah. use this against me. Right. And yeah. you made sure that I, I knew that it was real. And I haven't had one of those, I think, since. No. Right. No, I haven't no, had one I, since. No, no. But no, every time I've had one, yeah. that was a bad one. And that wasn't yeah. too long ago. Um, but, well, I, no, I know I have one Thanksgiving week. I got triggered. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and um, but again, you just, and then that night you said to me, all right, what else do you need from me? Yeah, and I said yeah. I, I just need some compassion. I, ju I just need you. I actually said to her, "I just need you to feel bad for me right now." I said, "Okay, I got you," and just didn't try and coach me up. And because Rosie does coach me up a lot, which is amazing. And sometimes you're in the mood for it, and sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're just like, "Hey, I just want to sit in this and have my, you know, I want to just be in it." Because you're always like, a lot of times when you're fixers, you're trying to give them positive things and this and that. And sometimes people just they just want to talk. They don't want to. They don't want a solution. They just want to get it off their chest, right. and that's okay too. Yeah. As long as it doesn't turn a pity party. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. With that said, for everybody out there going in the holidays, know that about your partner, especially if they're going to go see family that triggers them. Blaze. Hold on. I can't, I can't hear you. You got me now? You got you now. If you want okay, to good. just start yep. that. Cool. Yep. So for everybody who just heard this, again, the holiday times are hard. So a lot of times your significant other may be triggered by family or triggered by certain things or, or past loneliness or loneliness in the holidays. Or, you know, we tend to feel uh, miss, maybe miss loved ones, but just understand that, all right, something else is triggering them and make sure you know, run away, shame them, do what Rosie's done, lean into them more, be that teammate that they need, and really show them, I'm not going anywhere, I got you, what do you need from me right now, and make sure they do that for you when you need it as well, all right? Now, 
So that's the that was that's just a, a, little, a little a little yeah. a little uh, appetizer <laughs> here for what we're going to do here. Now, Rosie's story is incredible. It is incredible, and I, I guess I mean you could I, I jump in and I tell her story right. uh, <laughs> as much as she does, but Rosie here grew up in Idaho. Okay, uh, with an identical twin sister. So Rosie, let me just give you a little background. Rosie and her sister Renee uh, were the double mint twins in the double mint commercial. (laughs) Rosie was on Price is Right uh, as a showcase showgirl. She was um, 14 years. You're the face of Frederick's of Hollywood. Uh, She was on the very first ESPN2 show. I don't know if you guys remember. There's a show called Flex Appeal. The girl named Kiana. And they would have these workouts on the beach in like his <laughs> flimmiest little clothes. And all those dudes used to get up in the morning and watch his show on ESPN too. Rosie was on Flex Appeal for years. Um, and she and her sister also did Playboy together. Her sister was the first ever black playmate of the year. So she was a pioneer. Um, and th- that's a whole crazy story we'll get into here. But all this, she grew up where? I grew up in a really small town called Melba, Idaho. And it's like a super, super, super small town. It's got like 300 people in the whole town. We grew up on a farm right. out, like literally out in the middle of nowhere. And 300 people like, and only two black people. Yeah. And there's a, yeah. There's no, like if you go to Idaho, there's like, no, like, like it was just very, right. like the whole state, like it was just, just a handful of White. like African-Americans right. and like they all knew each other. And uh, my sister and I grew up on a farm. It's on top of the, the Snake River Canyon. It's actually beautiful. Really, really pretty. But like literally there's in the middle in, of in nowhere, the middle of nowhere in this little trailer house. Uh, um, in a little trailer house like, with seven of you in it. Yeah, we right. had uh, three older brothers. Yeah, then my, uh, my right. uh, half brother. Yeah, so it was like a it was a pretty full house, but um, we were always like getting into trouble and stuff like that on the farm because it was just uh, there's nothing to do, so you just go out and get mischievous right. and stuff like that. <laughs> it's a fun place to grow up. I, I, I went to their town uh, and there was was there a stoplight? I don't there's remember. A, I don't know if there's a stoplight. There's right, like, so, stop not signs. a stoplight. Okay, so <laughs> stop signs, not a stoplight. Uh, I don't remember a stoplight. Um, I remember two bars and that's about it. And um, a gas station and your high school. But talk about, I mean, growing up was hard though. Yeah, it was growing hard. Was my, our, our parents, like my dad was African-American. My mom's was Caucasian. And so like when they got married in the fifties, it wasn't legal for a black man to marry a white woman. So they had to go yeah. to uh, Nevada and come back and like get married. And I remember growing up, like my mom, like she's got- well, by, the, by the way, again, let's just not throw that away. <laughs> it was illegal. This wasn't too long ago. No, it was like in the- It was illegal. Yeah, it was illegal. A black yeah. man to marry a white woman in, Idaho. in, the, state yeah, of Idaho. in Idaho. In the state of Idaho. So they had to go to another state, which yeah. is just mind boggling. Yeah, it was, it was definitely crazy. <laughs> but my dad uh, was a farmer. And we grew up on a farm and uh, they were, they were, you know, uh, they were, they were married, which was very unusual for that to happen in that time. But I remember when my sister and I would go out like with my mom and like, people would be like, oh my gosh, you know, these their little daughters are cute. Are you, you babysitting? And she'd say, no, they're mine. And then like these people were just like, look at her like, oh my God, you slept with a black man. <laughs> it was like crazy. <laughs> and so like they, they would immediately like, you know, look at her and, go the other way but uh so it was like something that was interesting that happened a lot there but um it was just a like that my parents probably experienced it more than my sister and I did but so you experienced it but you two were just so forgiving of everyone and like in school you got in trouble and what they do well we would we were always doing like little like getting in like doing little machines what do they do you two they would like make you put your nose on like a little piece of tape and then they would march the school around like to show like the kids that were being bad, like what? No, like, but they didn't do it to the white yeah. kids. They did it to you two. <laughs> no, like, I, there, there might've been some in there. Like, we were, like, he got, we were like these two were so forgiving we were, like, of the world. We were all being, like, it's incredible. Yeah, bad. but babe, like, they didn't do it to the white kids. They did it to the two black girls. <laughs> we were, and you were always like, ah, we now it's okay. Like, like, the trouble, no, babe, I'm sure a lot of people were causing trouble, but they didn't stick their... Yeah. nose on the flagpole but, and march around them but, and taunt them. So, but also, you know, listen, my, my, what I look up to Rosie about so much is you guys know how hard I work. We want to talk about work ethic, talk about what your, your schedule was growing up. Yeah. So my sister and I, like, we like were on a farm. So there you would do like topping corn, hoeing beets, all this stuff. Um, but we were also in track. So we like no hard work because we would get up before we went to work and we would, school. before we went to school and we would go like, 
like Hope Eats and then go to work. Or Hope, we would Hope go, Eats and Top Court. Yeah, and Top Court, which You're is working not in these like on a farm. It is at such hard 4 work. in the morning. Yeah, and then, and then we would go, we, we might even come like jogging up with our hoes because we were like going to kill two birds with one stone <laughs> so we were just like like we were kind of crazy but we um we would do that because that's what it you know growing up on a farm mm-hmm. you do a lot of hard work yeah and so like I so, so it's like 4 30 in the morning to 7 30 in the morning yeah and then, and then we'd, or, no, we'd, we'd get up, cause you we'd get up because you have to get up kind of early to right. get there and then we'd work a few hours and then go to school and then uh but that's yeah. insane that's like yeah. growing up as kids how much do you get paid not a like lot. A, it was a big, like a dollar or something. Then I think my dad kept it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we didn't even get that. So, so your dad took your yeah. money and didn't get to have it. But yeah, but my sister and I stood up for ourselves after a while. We're like, wait a second, we want our money. So it wasn't a lot, but <laughs> and then you also you ran tra- you you were yeah also, we were state and track. Yeah, well, we were we were we were in track. We did like um, hurdles. I did hurdles, long jump. Right. Uh, I went state. Uh, yeah, so it was fun. We were like track stars. Yeah, so you got up in the morning. You worked these fields to top corn in Hope Beach for three hours. <laughs> your dad took your money. Yeah. <laughs> and then you went to work. Then you went to track practice. Yeah. And then you came home late at night. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's again, that's uh, a, just a different level. But I, I what got me about you two, and again, her sister, Renee, if you look them up, the Tennyson twins, when I say they're identical, they are identical. Rosie parts her hair on the side. Renee parts her hair in the middle, so you can tell the difference. And that's it. And that's yeah. And sometimes we're all hanging out, and I'll grab the wrong hand, and <laughs> Renee will just go wrong one, or cop a, the wrong butt to yeah. the wrong one, and, and they look exactly <laughs> the same. And they and we're the same, the same height, same weight, same everything. Same they everything. talk the same. Yeah. They say the very, same. Very similar paragraphs at the same time. They're kind of always fighting for every time. So they're saying the <laughs> same paragraphs at the same time. Um, but it's beautiful. Uh, you guys have always had each other lean on all these years where, again, you grew up in poverty. You grew up where you had to work harder than anybody I've ever known at that age. Um, but you have each other. And it kind of, I, I love the story of you guys um, kind of be able to put your arm around each other and, 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 having early goals about what's going to be yeah i remember we lived on the top of the sacred canyon which is really beautiful and uh we would sit there and we'd see these cars like driving at night and my sister and i we didn't know how we didn't know what was going to happen but we would always say we're going to get off this farm and we're going to go to california and be models and we just were like always dreaming always thinking about that we just were just like we're gonna somehow some way we're gonna because we knew we were like two you know we were like we're too big for this farm. We don't want to be on this farm. Like, this is like, this isn't us. So um, we were just like dreaming when we were little girls. We'd always like think about that. And then if that's eventually what happened. You, we put it out to the universe. And years later, that was, we did end up moving to LA and becoming models. Right. So. Well, now before that, let's talk about how, so Rosie, you went to Boise State, which that in itself. Yeah, I did go to Boise getting State. Getting yourself yeah. into Boise State. Yeah, I went to right? Boise and State. And paying for yourself. So having this hard work and you're working at, Albertsons. Albertsons. I was working at this, not even, it wasn't as glamorous as the grocery store Albertsons. I was actually in the warehouse for Albertsons and I was like packing these boxes and stuff. Really uh, working yeah. on the conveyor belt. On the line. conveyor belt. From line. like an officer and a gentleman, yeah. not like, realizing that she's a really hot girl. Like, the grocery store would have been glamorous. I was like filling these boxes. And not only that, shift. it was like <laughs> nine at night till six in the morning. So it was night shifts too, like 40 or 50 hours a week. Right. But, and in the uh, meantime, your sister. She was dating this guy who was like, uh, he was really into Playboy. And he was, they were looking, they had this contest and they were looking for this 35th anniversary Playmate. So he's like, you're really, you know, you could be a Playmate. You should send your pictures in. So she sends her pictures into this contest and like, they get like thousands, probably 14,000 entries. And out of those 14,000 entries, they picked 12 to become, to test to be Playmates. And half when hers came through, writes PMOY, which means playmate of the year. And they had never picked an African-American or girl or black girl to be playmate of the year ever. So it was kind of a big deal when, the, when you know, this came through and it was like around the time, like Vanessa Williams and all this stuff. So um, she ends up like flying to LA. Like the Naomi Campbell. Yeah, Naomi Vanessa Campbell Williams time. Like, like you know, it was around that time. Tyra Banks, yeah. yeah. Not Tyra yet, Na- but Na- kind Na- of similar, but Naomi and, and right. Vanessa okay. and all those guys. So um she ends up, you know, shooting for that. And then Hef does end up picking her, which was a huge deal because he had never, like, he just broke the color barrier. It was like, she was on Oprah and CNN and, and everyone was just like, you can't, everyone was like, a lot of people were saying, you can't pick her. This isn't fair because she's black. And he's like, it's what's not fair is that it took 
us this long to actually pick one. That's what's not fair. So that it was just really cool because there are certain people in your lives that change your destiny. And that was like one for us that because of that, that choice that changed my life, my sister's life, my family's life. Well, you had the choice too. And you oh, said, yeah, actually, I, I, I yeah, this is the, the part of the story where Tep wanted actually my sister and I both to pose because he's like, oh my God, there's twins. Of course, this is great. So me being shy at the time, I was like, oh no, no, you know, I'm, I'm like kind of shy, but you go do this and we'll, we'll see how it goes, you know? So then she ends up winning Playmate of the Year. She gets like a hundred thousand dollars. She gets all this fame. She gets a car. She gets all this stuff. And then I, Meanwhile, I know it. Everybody knows what I look like naked. Except <laughs> from your sister. That's <laughs> my twin sister. <laughs> I'm like, I get nothing. You know, I'm still over there at the, the Albertsons warehouse. But also, you're at the Albertsons warehouse yeah. and you're, you yeah. see, yeah. you had to pack yeah. her Playboys yeah. into, no, no, on no, the conveyor belt, no, into boxes no, and stuff. No, like, no. like, like <laughs> no, but I, I was just like, I was like, wait a second, I, I made the wrong choice here. I should have like, you know, right. I should have done it. But um, yeah, but it so, was really so cool. Renee, so Renee ends up moving out to LA into the Playboy Mansion because she becomes friends with Hugh Hefner's wife, Kimberly. Kimberly. Yeah, Kimberly, yes. So Kimberly kind of ran the show. Wasn't the Hugh Hefner that we all have seen these, these, you know, um, no, Kimberly was running recently. a tight ship. No, right. she was Kimberly scary. was running a tight ship. Yeah. But Hugh Hefner calls Rosie and says, Rosie. This was actually, this was later in life. Cause right. I, this was like later down the line. Cause he always was like, you know, wanting us to, to right. pose together, but I, I never did. So, but then he, he's, my sister sees him at a party one time and he comes up to her and he hands her this piece of paper and it says tennis and twins. And he says, I want you two to pose in the magazine together. I've always wanted you two to pose. I'll fly you anywhere in the world if you two will do this pictorial together. So my sister and I are like, by and the he did I was, say, "Hey Rosie, everybody knows you look yeah. like naked already. You might as well yeah. get paid for it, right? Because so, your sister." And I had been modeling and stuff by then for like, you know, I I wasn't shy anymore. So I was like, you know what? Let's do it. So it was like really cool because we went to Cuba. And we, well, wait, wait, wait. Let's not yeah. throw that away. Let's not throw it away. Rosie still kind of, you know, not um, all in. Says, "Sure, Cuba. I'll do it if you could send me to Cuba." Under Fidel Castro, knowing that it's not going to happen, right? And Hugh Hefner is like, done. Has these two on a plane to Cuba under Fidel Castro, which was supposed to be a 10-day shoot, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and talk about what happened there. Well, it's beautiful. It was a really cool place to shoot because at that time it wasn't, you know, it hadn't, there was not a lot of, you know, photo shoots or anything there. But it's, nothing there. it's just beautiful, it. though. The, the, it's just a really great amazing place to shoot but it's like a time warp it's like in the 50s like they've got old cars and like these billboards and stuff like that so you literally feel like you're in the 50s you said and, billboards are like bad about yeah like sam, and, sam and like yeah. the, you, you know like them and it's just a really weird like it's like a, you're just right. in a time warp and you, and you what tell uh, and you you said the thing that stuck out most you weren't a lot of eat Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they have beautiful beaches. They're, like, amazing. But you don't see anybody, like, fishing in the, the beaches, or so, which is weird. So we're like, why isn't anybody fishing? And they're like, well, it's because, you know, the fish belong to Castro. So, like, it was like that. Like, they, so Fidel you know, Castro yeah, thought like, he owned the Yeah, so it was, like, kind of, kind of crazy, right. yeah. So, but the people are amazing and beautiful, and it was a really cool and Castro experience. was cool with it until... Until, he like, until he wasn't. And then, like, all of a sudden, <laughs> like, maybe, like, a couple of days before we're supposed to leave, the guys, the scouts and stuff that we're with, they're kind of, like, starting to get a little antsy and a little they're freaked out, out. Because, like, Fidel's, like all of a sudden not down with Playboy being in his country and shooting these. Fidel Castro suddenly does yeah. not want the tennis so in his like, country. Oh my God. They're like, we need to get you guys out of here. Cause this is like, not good. So my sister and I, like we cut our trip short by two days and I, I couldn't even sleep. How did they, they get you out? Uh, I can't remember where we flew out of, but we, we cut the trip short and then. Did you go through like Belize? Maybe. I, I okay. it was so long ago. I don't remember, but I believe it was Belize, but yeah. And then we just like cut it short, but the pictures, like it, it, and actually, Playboy held it for a while because they right. were they didn't run because it right it was away. Fidel Castro. Yeah, so they ended up running it like years later, and uh, we're fined a huge fine for running. Oh, oh, wait, 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 just don't throw that away. So he holds on to these photos of the Tennyson twins for a couple of years. Finally, post them, and whoever the president was at the time fined Hugh Hefner, or I think, Playboy. a quarter yeah. of a million yeah. dollars. Yeah, yeah. They got a quarter of a million yeah. dollars a for sending the Tennyson tw twins. To Cuba under Fidel Castro. Shooting, yeah. <laughs> I guess, I guess it's like, so anyway. And their star went, phew, they're huge. But at the time, too, 
Rosie was, so Renee's living at the mansion, right? And then she, she, they invite you to come out there and live. Yeah, there. this is my very, this is backpacking when I first moved to LA right. and I came to visit Renee and I was over there at Sundries of or at Albertsons working these like um, mm-hmm. really long shifts. So I get there and I'm like, wait a second, I'm her twin. I look just like her. I could, I could actually do this. I could do this modeling thing. So I go back, I quit my job. I'm like, Hey, you guys, I'm out of here. I'm going to move to LA to be a model, which is what I did. I, I you know, I right. moved there and I went to, uh, uh, to an agency and I was able to get, I just took my sister's photos to go get an agent, you know, cause we look alike. So we're twins. So I so just, she takes Renee's modeling, modeling book as her own. <laughs> And gets gets an, gets an agent, starts my that's you know I, and I, gets prices right yeah. and projects of Hollywood. <laughs> well, I, did, I got and me owned after that. You were married with children yeah. a bunch, and flex yeah. appeal, and did all these things, and you guys became iconic yeah, black fun. models back yeah. then. It was fun, yeah. We right? were like, yeah, we were like probably one of the first, like right around the time when Tyra and and like right. yeah, there was a lot like Naomi and Tyra and and you know it was fun. It was so fun. so okay, so a couple of things here. First of all, when you're living at the mansion, okay. What's it like to live at the Playboy Mansion? Like all of us probably thinking, oh my gosh, there's like, you know, orgies every day. This and that. Like, <laughs> what's it like to actually live there? How many girls were living there? At the time when they, when you're they're testing for your pictorial, that they fly the um, playmates in that were shooting the pictorial. So there could have been like two or three girls that were actually shooting, testing for the magazine. And But they're not living there. They're no, just, they no, there's no, there, there's no. How there. many girls live there? Just you and Renee? Uh, at that time, yeah, there was no other. So girls. just you and yeah. Renee. <laughs> We're the only ones living at the mansion with Hugh Hefner and his wife. Well, we were in the game room. We were in the other. Yeah, but you're we're living at the like, mansion. Yeah, we were at state. Well, well I think all of us think yeah. there's like 20 women that are living there and it's Hef and yeah. it wasn't like that. No, it, was it wasn't like that. No, not because he was married at the time with Kim and Kim was like, you know, it wasn't, I mean, before Kim came along and maybe after Kim came along, I, I, I couldn't, it wasn't like it was with Kim because she was very, you know, protective. And so you couldn't really, you know, get close to yeah. Hef. And we we're, we were friends with her, so it was right. like a different, a different like kind of okay. experience. All right. So um, the uh, how crazy were the the parties at, at the mansion? Parties were kind of crazy, but <laughs> but I, I I would always like duck out or dip out, you know, <laughs> before like the crazy stuff happened. But they were it was fun because it was like you know when you would go to the mansion, you would actually go out like in lingerie, like you'd head out your house, like where like how many parties are you going to go at, like to right. where you're wearing like lingerie. Some people, like some girls didn't even have anything on. They were just like, it was, it was funny, but um, it was uh, just a crazy fun. How many experience. celebs did you walk in on having sex at the mansion? I mean, sister walked in on, uh, I think it was Tony Curtis. I think. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting it on. Like, How old was yeah, he at the time? He was pretty, uh, like pretty old, but he was like, he wasn't stopping him. He was getting some at the mansion for sure. <laughs> um, you also, there was, I asked you about the grotto and you said there was only one time that you guys went to the grotto because someone told you you had to see what was going on and you get right away yeah yeah that was Are that you, was kind of crazy that was can we say it i don't know if i want to say it but... i'll say it she but... told me that she's down in the grotto and mini me started an orgy there was like there was like some stuff going <laughs> on and you like there were some players in it but it's yeah, something you wouldn't expect that was like i i laughed i was just like wow well, <laughs> but uh scream yeah right away <laughs> no i did not stand <laughs> not sticking around for that but it wasn't so, like so the, the mansion though wasn't a place that i'm thinking this just you know sex drugs rock and roll but when you were living there it, was it like that or was it the opposite the, you know i think it was for people who wanted that if you were like into that like if you like late in the night and stuff like that no whatever. i mean for you two no not for us no it wasn't like she had rules for you yeah no we had rules right. you had to be in a certain time they were like uh no you boys know, they, no, yeah, drugs. no boys they didn't want you drinking no drugs no drinking either no right. yeah they were okay. like very i mean you had to, they were like very strict okay. very strict so it wasn't like our experience wasn't like that and but i i do believe it's a different kind of a time at that time because right. it was Kimberly they had kids so um right. but I do you know I, I that was all, my, all, I can only speak from my experience but you know um yeah I think it was kind of a crazy place for sure and I thought it was wild too because I figured you know hey okay she was there in the early days um and, and Rosie and I when we first started dating said okay well, look at listen I've been with certain people you probably know you probably been with people I know let's kind of lay our cards on the table and she, Rosie was like no no you're you're what'd your brother tell you like you never really went with 
yeah, actors well, or yeah. athletes like my, or musicians or one of, anything. Yeah, my older brother was like always like, you know, he was always, he would always give my sister and I really good advice. So he's like, hey, you know, you don't want to be one of those girls who just sleeps with everybody and you know, and and when they gets used up and out. Yeah. So he was like, be you know, don't don't be those don't be those girls. So it was just good advice. So my sister, he's like, you know work and do you know get your jobs and be respected and you don't you don't want to be those girls so my sister and I always knew that plus we always had each other so we always were always like um respected and you know like, yeah well and then also like I gotta say so like I do know like everybody was after Rosie everybody Renee was with somebody Rosie was single but like Prince was after you <laughs> was. in a big way <laughs> Prince was. you gotta tell the Prince story yeah he was I, and I love <laughs> Prince I I, I Prince fan, Prince fanatic. But they were all after you. Like every every actor in Hollywood was after. I think, you. yeah, they were probably after like a lot yeah. of. Girls. And Renee too, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but um, yeah. So so we go to uh, bar one, this place called Bar One, and Prince is there, and, and he's got um, there's like bodyguards, and he's like got this little orange tootsie pop, and orange is the only flavor. It had to be orange. <laughs> so he um he wants to go out, you know. So at the time, I, I you know I was kind of fresh from Idaho. So I was very leery of Prince, you know, and fresh from Idaho and Prince <laughs> trying to figure out. Yeah. And I'd see, you know, how he was with, you know, Purple Rain. So he <laughs> asked me out and I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. So I kept saying no, kept saying no. And he keeps calling, keeps calling. So finally he's like, you know, okay, so what if I, I just take you and we just drive around the block and you just go and, and like, just let's do that. Would and you, listen to new music. And listen to some new music. Would you do some, that? He so, wants to try out new music on yeah. him that hasn't been. So out you yet. just listen to some new music. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So so I'm, so he comes over and he he's a, he's a little limo and he drives. What's, what's he wearing? Uh, I don't remember what he had on. Okay. Probably like a little suit or something. So anyway, he suit or he, jumpsuit. Or, or, uh, maybe like the jumpsuit. So he always had okay. that little okay. outfit that he has on. Okay. Okay. So um so he takes you around the block and he says there's this new album it's gonna it's called diamonds and pearls so so like so i'm listening to this thing i'm like so you got to hear diamonds and pearls before everybody like, else think you think it's gonna be a hit i think you got a hit on your hands here it's pretty good <laughs> so um so then you know so then you know like i, I and that doesn't seal the deal for prince no 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 because i still wasn't trusting him i was you know like so so i, I it's prince I, I know i know but okay so so i leave and and um i no no, I try to leave. No, no, so I try to no, try to leave, but he's like, he's he says, Hey, he's like, Do you want to come back to my house and I'll make some pancakes? So I'm like, <laughs> not good, you know. So it's so not just a weird thing to say, you know. So I'm just like, whatever. So this so is just, his line. It's a strange thing to say. So I'm like, no, I'm good. So I take off. So so then, you know, he keeps calling, keeps calling, and and I wait, wait, let's back up. So his line yeah. was can I take you back to my house and make you some pancakes? Yeah. So I'm like, no, I'm good. So, what, what, what was your reaction when he said that though? It was, you know what? I mean, it was a strange thing, a strange <laughs> yeah, like, I would thing say to so. ask. So I was just like, no, I'm good. <laughs> like, I'm cool. So see ya. So I get out. And then, you know, he keeps calling and, and and now I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to, you know, bypass this Prince thing altogether. So, so. Which which not many people which, have, yeah, I'm assuming. So, right. so I, I pan to like, maybe like a month later. I'm This friend of mine's like a fan of. By, by the way, who would ever thought? A woman would choose Glazer what? over Prince. <laughs> I mean, uh, hashtag something nobody would ever say. No, because I, I knew girls who dated him, and he just kind of like messed with their heads and all that stuff. So I was like, Nah, I'm not going to go there. So anyway, so I go to these clubs, and I'm like, I see Prince out, and I'm with this girlfriend who's a Prince fanatic, and I'm like, Oh wait, I wonder if he's mad because I, you know, I haven't, I just kind of blew him out of the water. So um, when I see him, he like looks over and he sees me, and then he does like this. Uh, which for people who can't see like, he does three like snaps three snaps and then he just him and his whole entourage just leave the club i mean he's like mad and so i'm like oh my god <laughs> i can't believe it you know, so, where it's just like freaking like it was that for me so then i'm like oh well, maybe it was a mistake or whatever so we go i see him again at another club this is like maybe like two weeks later and he does the exact same thing so he was just like from he broke prince. yeah he was just mad like he, he broke like, prince no no he was just mad. <laughs> so so anyway but yeah so he was like uh funny because then like years later i watched this dave Chappelle show and <laughs> did it they talk about like where prince says he's gonna make these pancakes and i just bust up laughing because it was like the thing that i don't just, remember that the Chappelle show yeah it yeah it's it's totally oh it's, really yeah. oh it's i totally there. i don't remember that remember i remember the tootsie like, pop and i remember yeah, it's, it's, so he really said yeah. that to you wow and that was the Chappelle yeah. show yeah and that's the basketball and the, the, oh the, my the, gosh yeah, so i'm just incredible. laughing because i was like that's exactly what he said you know so it was funny oh my god all right so your life then again you go on uh all right so you're on price is right 
How was it being a showcase showgirl? It was fun. That was because I'd always watched Price is Right as a little girl. So to be on there, and I was on there with uh, Nikki, which right. is one of my great friends. I was a uh, bridesmaid in her wedding, Nikki Zering. And um, so it was a lot of fun. He was a friend of mine. And yeah. What, so um, how was Bob Barker? He was great. Actually, was he? he was great. Yeah. yeah, he was really cool. He was actually really nice. And um, all the, every, everything, every, that was just such a fun experience. It's like a, like a dream come true. What was your favorite acting or modeling job you did. And now, like, she'll come up with that. And by the way, here's the thing that the crazy part Rosie ended up graduating. Oh, UCLA. UCLA in broadcasting or ju- yeah, broadcast yeah. journalism because she wants to be a sports reporter. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I don't know this until a year ago. Like, hello, like, Rosie, <laughs> how do you fail to tell me this? And then tells me she was a researcher in Fox Sports in the early 90s. Like the same thing I did but to start my career at CBS, login game tape. Yeah, and I'm like, watch and like put in the, like, I'm telling you right now, <laughs> us, if we saw his playmate sitting there doing, and she's over there in the research, you're like, you I, I, you gotta be kidding me. And like, again, she doesn't tell me this till like I recently. Was there. Like, I wasn't oh, there by the for way. Very long. I was only there for a couple of weeks and then I ended up oh. like, like going on to what I do now, but it was fun. It was oh, fun. so that, uh, okay, okay, okay. So you do that. All right. And then after that, um you go um yeah she she had a you know i've told you guys it's it's never too late to make a change right you, we, i've talked about this you can change your life in a fraction of a second and you decide to yes. you decide to get out of modeling all together you and your sister together right the again at your height right well yeah we had we modeled for years and years and years, but then after a while, I kind of was like, you know what? I, I kind of just, the, I just lost the thrill and wanted to do something else. So I remember I was thinking, gosh, what could I do? What could I do? And then I was watching this Oprah show called find your passion. And they were like telling you if you could do anything and, and it, a genie came down and said, Hey, you know, you could do whatever you want. It's not, no one's telling you, you don't have the experience. You're too old or this or that. What would you do? Like, and my sister and I were like, well, we would probably do something in fashion because we used to like design our own clothes and all the stuff. So that's what we kind of were like, well, wait, what if we did something in fashion? What if we start like a clothing company, which was like something we never would have thought of or never would have even allowed ourselves to even dream to do. And like, well, slowly but surely we started like, you know. So you, what, how old are you at this time? You decided gosh, to reinvent yourself. It was like probably, yeah, I'm like, uh, in our 30s okay yeah you decide in your 30s yeah. you're going to re- completely reinvent yeah. your yeah. whole life and whole career yeah so i want people to hear that too that's brave yeah, that's never it's, that takes yeah courage. yeah because it, it, it's a completely different than what we were doing but um so we just started off like small and we got like a little kiosk and like this is you, you know a kiosk in, in idaho which okay. but we were flying back and forth. so a kiosk in a mall in idaho yeah. and you were so you started selling clothes uh, we were doing accessories at the time. Yeah. Okay. You were so, designing them? Making those little like, rhinestone okay. jewelry and stuff like okay. that. It was like a little crazy. So it started there. Yeah. Right? It started small. And then um, we like had like, you know, several kiosks. And then a friend of ours was telling us, hey, you know, you should combine these into like one store. And, you know, because kiosks are actually very expensive. So um, we ended up combining all those three kiosks into so our first brick and mortar in store. Two states. Uh, right. No, just uh, in the in Idaho. In Idaho, three in kiosks. Idaho. But you were still living here, or did you move yeah, back to Idaho? Yeah, we fly back and forth. So you fly back and forth, and yeah. you just have people run those kiosks. For you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then we ended up getting our first brick and mortar in um, Santa Monica. Okay. This is like our very first like store, which was like like the start of like our. And their store is called Varga. It's called Varga, yeah. Right. And uh, it was named fun. after Alberto Varga, who was the yeah. He does like the like, pinup drawings from like the fifties. And it's like, it's really cool because it was like a really cool time, like when women were like very fashionable and they were dressed really like, like um, Elizabeth Taylor, or Marilyn Monroe or right. Audrey Hepburn. So it's like, inspired by that kind of concept. Right. And then, so then you get one brick and mortar mm-hmm. and you have since gone on to build this empire of how many brick and mortars? We've opened probably 30 Vargas over the course of since, since then, since we started. Stores. Yeah. 30 stores. <laughs> So again, I, went a little I, don't crazy. Wanna, I don't want to throw this. Yeah. No, 30 yeah. stores. But again, Han, I love you. To go from these two little girls who is we're making a dollar an hour working in these fields of topping corn and hoeing beets and getting their dad stealing the money from them <laughs> um, to 
going out and having a very successful, like getting off, off that farm in Idaho, having a very successful, you know, career in modeling and doing authentically and not having to sell your soul for it. And then in your thirties to say, we're going to pivot and do something completely different and build something that big on it is incredible. Oh, thank that, you. <laughs> it's incredible. And Rosie has a hard time with realizing how, successful she's been how magnificent that is like this is the same two girls who had their arms draped around them in idaho watching the cars drive to la and you have both done that that is you if that ain't the american dream folks, <laughs> i don't know what it is it, if that ain't two girls saying i don't care what uphill battles we have we're going to overcome them and make our dreams come true i don't know what that is Thank you. <laughs> can you give yourself a little grace and love yourself yeah, up? For it? I can love myself up. Yeah. It's been, I guess like it's hard to like when you look, it's hard to give yourself credit, I guess, for all the work. Cause we were always um, striving to do more and do more and do more. And then at some point I was like, wait, you know what? We've already, we've, we've done so much. Sometimes you kind of just need to just kick back and like enjoy everything that you've done mm -hmm. and see it. But it's sometimes hard to see for sure. But, but that's the thing. It's a huge lesson for everybody. It's like, that's where we get in problems is that we're, we want more, 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 and you never get to enjoy what you have, 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 have. Exactly. What you've yeah. done, 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 done. Like that's a big thing. And that's a huge thing that gets us in trouble in between our ears, you know, with anxiety uh, and with, with the grave, we get stuck in the gray because you don't allow yourself that grace of, yeah, I did this. Yeah. I've done this. And it, it's a, it's a huge thing that we now work on with Rosie so she could start loving herself for, for for all this. Rosie does it with me, so I can love myself up for all the different things I've done. I've reinvented myself five different times, you yeah, know, with, yeah. with different things, with businesses, charities, and you know, from from NFL to MMA to you know, mental health. Now, like God, I've you know reinvented a, a bunch, um, but we really have to love ourselves up for what we've done. That's true. Right. <laughs> Thank you, babe. All right, so now we're going to shift into. Uh, how Rosie and I met and we met in COVID, but yep. If, if Rosie can just move in a little towards you, move in. Oh. seems like it shifted. Oh, perfect. Perfect. How's this coming along, bud? This is incredible. It's felt like it's been three minutes. <laughs> this is by <laughs> far my cool, favorite. Right? Yeah. 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 He said it's by far his favorite one. Feels like it's been three minutes. Aww. So here we are in COVID um, I had gone to Pittsburgh on a business trip right before everything shut down. And I come back to my house and my friend, Nikki Zeering is there, who was my assistant at the time, who had also done, she was Ian Zeering's ex-wife and uh, she had done Playboy and, <laughs> and, and Price is Right with Rosie. Um, well, I come home and I have the Tennyson twins at my house and they are shit face drunk. <laughs> Just sitting there at my house. I'm like, and I knew who the Tennyson tw twins were. I, I didn't expect to ever see them at my house. I'm like, well, this is pretty fantastic right here. And um, Rosie and I just became friends in COVID. Like, you know, here in, in LA, you could, like no one wanted to look at you and, and all our yeah. businesses were closed down. Um, and our a couple of different times, we hung out just as friends. And um, one night, Nikki and, and Renee ended up going off in this deep conversation. And I really got to sit there and talk with Rosie. And we started talking about God and mm -hmm. our faith. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And we just started bonding. It was about three hours. Yeah. yeah. And so I shifted over for me as a friend to, man, this woman is fantastic. Um, and I said, Hey, I, I like to take a, a I know I have your number, number here now. No, can I get your number? I think you had my number. And yeah. I said, I'd like to, can I take you on a date? And you're like, yeah, 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 we, we could do that. Okay. But I literally go, like what she said to me that night was just so different than anything else. And what she said, by the way, she had been on, she said it to Nikki, um, but you had been on, I was running a, Emerge, okay, an MVP, MVP session. Yeah, it was MVP. Right? Yeah. I had her come on because actually Ro Rosie donated clothes to some of our veterans. Mm -hmm. yeah. She donated a lot of um, 
her equipment, her store to a lot of our veterans, yeah. right? For, from emerging vets and players. Um, so I said, well, I'd love to have you come on and I'd love for these people to thank you. So come on a session on Zoom. And man, we had about a hundred vets and players and it was really man, it was cool, by the way. It's very, really like, cool. Amazing. And yeah. uh, putting them together and, I, and I'm coaching it. And Rosie had said to Nikki, Oh yeah. So I, I was watching the, um, the, session. In, the session and Jay is always the one that's like, you know, leading the pack over there and cheering up out, just encouraging everybody and just really, really positive. And I was just, I could see how much he was like helping out everybody. Like he's just like motive, just being like this motivational person. So I was just like, wow, this, this guy, he's so amazing. He's, he's, he takes care of all these people. That's what you were just like giving. So giving what you're saying, but I, I was like, but who takes care of him? That's what I was just like wondering. Cause I was like, wow, he's so like, he's just giving so much for everybody. But you know, I was just like, who takes care of him? Who takes care of him? And then, and then after I, I asked her out, yeah. she said it again. She said yes, and then she says to Nikki again, "Hey, remember I said, man, this guy takes care of so many people, but who, who takes care of him? I think I want to be the one that takes care of him." Yeah, yeah, right. Like I said, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. That very yeah. same night, I said to her sister Renee, "Hey, Rosie's never been married." She said, "Nope." And that's the other part we have to tell you about Rosie. She said, "Nope." I said, "Why?" And Renee said, because all she does is take care of everybody else. She, she's never given herself time. Yeah, yeah. Right? To take care of anybody. She always takes care of everybody else. I said, wow, I'm going to marry your sister. <laughs> I literally said that to Renee. And Renee's like, mm, okay, yeah, sure you are. <laughs> Whatever. Right? Whatever, sure you are. And I said, no, I'm going to marry your sister. And it's the first time I'd ever felt like that in my life. First time I'd ever, and I, I, I'd heard what you said from Nikki, that you said, man, who takes care? This guy takes care of so many people, but who takes care of him? I want to be the one to take care of him. Just, I've just never heard that in my life. I've never, ever, ever heard that. And I was like, that's my soulmate. Aww. That's my wife. <laughs> and again, Rosie here has literally like helped out all her brothers get jobs and moved them in with her and helped her sister and her relationship. And I, she's just taken care of everybody else and those 30 stores. And she just never given herself grace to say it's my turn. So I think at one point you said, it's just not going to happen for you. Right. Yeah, I was so like, I kind of was so career driven. And plus I was like, you know, I was kind of um, had people like I was helping out and stuff, but in doing so, I just looked up and I was like, wait a second. I, realized I was like, I didn't get married. I didn't have a family. It's like, you know, I just, I, and then I, 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 at one point I was kind of depressed because I felt like I, I had just missed the boat and I was just, it was too late. And so I was like, wait a second, you know, um, wow. So I re remember like thinking like it was just not going to happen, but it did. It's, it, it's never too late. That's what the, the, Right. It's never too late. Like that's the but thing. You also like, started writing down. Yeah, I started to when I your new life. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So so I was like just kind of putting out to the universe what I wanted. So I kept like making all my passwords. I was like I changed them to to new life. I was wanting a new life. Um I was I was putting everything like a right like best life, this life. So I was like kind of thinking in my head like what I wanted to attract. And it was so amazing. It was right before we met. She yeah, changed right, all our passwords yeah, to everything. new life. When we meet 2020, yeah. Yeah. yeah, new life 2020. Uh, everything was new life 2020. It's like yeah. it became so instead of you, um, taking care of everybody it's else, wishing, it's the wishing the first for like, time you, yeah, allowed like, yourself to say, Yeah, I am worthy of this, yeah, I've got to make a change, yeah, that was big, yeah, which was so unlike right. me. And because I just had kind of gotten caught in a rut of doing the same thing over and over and over, and so I was like, You know what, in order for things to change, I have to change, I have to be different. So when Nikki called me to come over. Uh, that was something I may not have done, but then instead of saying no, I started saying yes. I was like, let, yeah, yeah, I'll come over. Yeah, let's, yeah, I've seen you all. So, but that one, you know, meeting of coming over to see Nikki brought me to meet you, which changed my life. So it's like, right. you know, you're just like one mm. person away from like your life changing or one, you know, like moment meeting, away. Right? Yeah, that changes your life. So one away. Really like, I did yeah. that once for yeah. us. I did that one away as a motiva weekly motivation. I got it from Rosie. She said, you're one away. You're one meeting away from changing your life. One opportunity. One opportunity, one dinner, one, person. one day, one person. You're one away. 
from one your encounter. life changing. Yeah. One, one encounter exactly. from your life changing. And she started believing that. Yeah. And she was. And thank God Almighty it happened because we met. Yeah. So and... now, okay, our our date, our first date, so no, we were closed in COVID. Um, and while we were closed, um, we went down and took a bottle of wine down by the beach in Santa Monica. And um, it was pretty hilarious. There was a guy with an acoustic guitar sitting oh, yeah. next to us. <laughs> and we're still trying to kind of feel each other out. And um, we actually, we drove to Malibu for a little bit because what a much you could do. We came back to Santa Monica where she lives. Um, I had a bottle of wine I brought. We sat down there and there was a guy with an acoustic guitar. So he was like, man, this is great. This is. Um, <laughs> it was by the Ferris wheel. It, it was very it was romantic. Back. It was, it was very, romantic. very beautiful romantic. It was perfect. And all of a sudden the guy says, hey, you two on a first date? We said, yeah. He goes, I got a song for you. And in acoustic sings. Baby, baby's got back. <laughs> baby got back. Yeah. But he was like a real. <laughs> but not like baby a, got back. He said, yeah, he was like, baby, baby got, got back. Oh my God. <laughs> it was really funny. And I'm like, babe, just so you <laughs> know, this is how my life is. If really something funny. crazy could happen, this yeah, is how it's it going to be. Really, it was actually really good. Right. Right. Really good. <laughs> I said, you'll always be entertained. <laughs> okay. So now our second date, um, I actually, Santa Barbara was open. I called Troy Aikman, who lives in Santa Barbara. And I said, brother, um, man, do you know um, the Tennyson twins? He's like, Rosie and Renee? I said, yeah, I know who they are. I said, well, man, I'm, I'm going on a date with Rosie. He goes, oh, wow, good for you. I said, but I want to take her to Santa Barbara because LA is not open. And I know you live there. Is there a restaurant you can get me into that you'll love? He goes, I love this Italian restaurant. I'll get you guys in. You're set. We drive up to Santa Barbara on our second date. We're in there. And then we go to Lucky's for a little nightcap over there. And all of a sudden, our phones start pinging and ringing and ringing, pinging and ringing. And everybody's like, you're right, you're right. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm with one of the Tennyson twins. We're at Santa Barbara. <laughs> Fantastic. And her phone's lighting up. And then my friend's like, yo, you need to come over there. Yo, you need to come over there. And I'm like, what is going on? And that was the night of the riots that happened here in L.A. And... Her cell phone, which shows her store, which was in Santa Monica Place, which shows hit, everybody really. looting the <laughs> entire mall. That mall. Destroys everything. And that's her main store. <laughs> so here we are on our second date, and they are putting her out of business. It smashed everything. Yeah, every, yeah. And we're just watching it from her phone. Jay, Jay, Jay. They yeah. didn't, but yes. they just, it was uh, just. Yeah, buddy. You, you guys froze up there. I'm waiting okay. for you to get back here. And just okay, pick it we up. Here, right? here, we were, here we were on our second date. Okay. And then say it again. Yep. So here we are on our second date, and all our like our our phones start pinging, and my friend's like, "Yo, you're right, you're right." I'm like, yeah, "I'm great." I'm with one of the Tennyson twins in Santa Barbara. Right. It's fantastic. <laughs> like, yo, you just come to the house. Yo, you're all right. And like, my friends are, you know, we have a lot of thuggish friends, so they're like, "Yo, you okay? Yo, you okay?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm good." And and. uh Rosie's phone is just buzzing off the hook, buzzing off the hook. And then finally we look at her phone and we see her main store, which is in Santa Monica place. Yeah. That's when the riots happened and they just wiped out the entire mall. Yeah. They didn't get, well, they got, they got everything, but we're watching on video on her phone of them smashing the windows of the stores next to her. Yeah. Yeah, and across, yeah. they didn't get they didn't smash her one. There's two stores they didn't smash the windows of, right? Ours Yours and Spanx. Spanx. <laughs> Everything else. No idea why. I don't know. And 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 I didn't think they know knew you were a black owned yeah, store, I but I don't know. you got spared. Know. But yeah. it didn't matter. They put the whole mall out of yeah. business. And man, Rosie, yeah, it was like intense. The National Guard was there. It was just it was yeah. really crazy. And meanwhile, I'm trying to fly back at one o'clock in the morning and get her there. And even though, like, what are we gonna do? Um, but I also want to make sure like my, my house was safe. And, um, so we ended up getting back there. Unfortunately, Rosie lost her store. Yeah. We ended up having to close that store because the mall, it just, it's still, it's still struggling because it's just, you know, but still had to pay rent. Yeah. It's very. Okay. And then all her other stores that were closed, she still had to pay rent for yeah, this is COVID so, was was very rough. It was really hard for a lot time of people. For, yeah, for you, yeah, right? For really sure, difficult. For sure. Time. Yeah, for sure. And here you are in a new relationship, and I was just like, "Hey, you know, we we're, we're about we dated for about ten months or something like that." And I knew, man, this girl's my soulmate. She's it for me. And um, 
and Rosie ends up breaking up with me. <laughs> NFC Championship game. Right after, I'm like, babe, we're going to have a whole, like, our whole offseason now come. We're really going to work on everything. And she said, no, I'm not coming home today. I, I just, we need a break. I'm like, what? She goes, I need to go save my store. And I know you need a lot of attention and time. And the only way I'm going to do this is I have to do this. I have to go. I'm going to pull us out of debt. I'm like, no, no, I got it. I got it. I said, no, no. And she's like, I don't want to be like every other girl and just take from you. I'm going to do this. Which, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, it was my baby and I just was like, I, I, I got myself in this mess. I'll get myself out. So that. Then I, from there, you get I, yourself in a mess. Yeah, <laughs> riots and yeah, COVID I mean, did it. Like, or yeah, you were doing great. Was it your thing to like take on? So it was right. like, it was. I didn't, you know. So I, I just did what I had to do. That was a was, really hard time. Yeah, it was for, a very me because I thought she's my soulmate, and man, you know me who my mental health issues believes like you know the universe is gonna come crashing down around me and the sky is falling. The sky fell that day and it came out of nowhere, and you just kept telling me, no, we're just gonna take a break till I get myself yeah, out of this. Yeah. I, but I'm not having you pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I was very, very conflicted because I'm like, yeah, but then you're abandoning me. Yeah. Yeah. It and felt like I was like, right. but I was like, no, but I, I'm not, you know, I can't, I didn't feel right about like having him take on right. all this stuff that wasn't yours. So, which no, I, I don't know another girl who would have done that. Like, like <laughs> that they would just said, okay, yeah, take it. If you can help me out take it, take care of it. Great. And she just didn't. And and she kept also assuring me, this isn't forever. This is just a break. In yeah, my mind, yeah. it's forever. <laughs> it's dead. It's no way. Um, and I was, it's the first time I'd ever been in a tank. Really, really in a tank. Because I'm like, man, this is like, I finally got like this, this soulmate of mine who I did believe was like set up through God. Because we are like, you have to get me. And you have to get Rosie. And you if you get us, you really understand how special we are. And we got each other. And, you know, all of a sudden it's gone. And I don't hear it's just a break. I hear it's forever. To the point where I say, well, I don't even want to be in California anymore. And I'm so heartbroken. I need to start something for myself, a, a new life for myself. And I moved to Arizona. Yeah. And the day before I left, Rosie came over to the house to tell me, hey, I got my ship straight. I'm ready to get back. And I said, well, if you're going to get back, it's going to have to be in Arizona because I've moved. And that was really hard. Rosie yeah. started yeah. crying. I don't see her cry a lot. She started <laughs> crying. Um, and, it, you know, I made my decision. And, and uh, she said, well, I told you it was just a break. Um, I guess I'll have to start coming to Arizona and nobody knows, but you know, last football season, every single week, Rosie flew to Arizona from Wednesday to Friday or Saturday every week and fought to get me back, which was huge. Yeah. To put the time in. Right. Yep. And, and eventually Mm -hmm. said to me, um, and, and, but now back it up here. Um, when Rosie first did break up with me, I went into this horrifically downward spiral. And I was already in an odd place because when I wrote Unbreakable, people don't know this, but I, I stopped all my treatment for my mental health illness and, and issues, um, which was all therapy. I do a lot of vitamins and IVs and things like that um, and different therapies. I've used there three therapists, but I work at my mental health. I stopped it all to be in as dark a place as I could be. So when I wrote Unbreakable, it was so authentic. This is what depression feels like. This is what anxiety feels like. This is what ADHD feels like. And it it took a long time to try and get myself out of that hole. Um, and I did that for everybody else sitting at home. So I can describe it and give it words. So you all have the words to be able to, you know, use moving forward and have conversations with people. Um, so I was still trying to come out of that. And then this happened with Rosie. I really went off the deep end. And it forced me to really go get help that I needed to change habits forever. And I look now and say, if we didn't break up, we probably wouldn't have made it. 
because I really learned how, you know, in that time I went to Thailand and I you learned did a lot of work on yourself. I did a lot sure, of work on myself. Sure. Right? You did yeah. a lot of work yeah. on yourself. Yeah. You had a, you had a we different issues, but yeah, but like that different. you weren't worthy of this. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Right? There was a, yeah different things, yeah, for sure. And you did a lot of work, and then you talk. You what did you say to me one day? You're going to put your captain's hat on. And, yeah. What, what is that? What? Uh, this is like I was talking about your destiny when you're like you're choosing your destiny. It's like you have to be the one that puts the the captain's hat on and then steer your life the way you want it to go, even if it's not you know initially where you want it. You have to be like on a little you know, it might be a little canoe boat and then pretty soon you go to the motorboat then, but you're the one with the ability to take your life in the direction that you want it to go mm -hmm. and your destiny, which is what you're really good at. And so am I. Well, you <laughs> decided to do that and say, no, yeah. I could, I'm, I'm worthy of this now. So yeah. you put that captain yeah. down and said, no, I'm, I'm going to steer my boat into Jay's waters. Yeah. And for me, I went to Thailand and I learned how to heal that little kid in me, how to feel like the universe wasn't against me, how to under, and really there I understood I've been putting all this pain for all these years so I could help others through theirs. And Rosie and I were talking, then we weren't together, but I called her from there and I'm like, oh my God, I am worthy of being loved. I now know why I had this pain. And by the way, I almost had this, like when I was out there, this, this epiphany, like this voice from like God in the universe of, Hey, listen, you, you needed to be in this kind of pain so you could help others through, through theirs but we need you to understand and see we made all your other dreams come true to keep you afloat. And that changed everything for me. I used to always feel like I was cursed with this, you know, depression, anxiety, and the sky is falling mentality. And now I felt like God blessed me with these mental health issues to help others. And cause I want to live a life of service. I want to leave something behind in this life. And I know that unbreakable has saved lives. I've been, we, you and I read messages of people who were going to commit suicide now didn't because of this book or people who are so lost now found their way because of this book or this podcast or something I said of somebody, we do a, a, a weekly motivation and that day that person needed to hear that message. And if they didn't, they might've made the ultimate wrong decision. Like we've got, you and I yeah, get weekly yeah. messages oh, yeah, like all that. The time. All so the I understand time. why we had to do it, right? So um, so Rosie's coming out every week. And finally, I just kind of wanted to hear from her, hey, I'll move to Arizona. I want to be with you. But I still have my stores back in LA, so I'm going to have to commute. I just kind of wanted to hear that from her. And once she said that to me, I said, no, I don't want to commute. I want to be with you all the time. Okay, I'll move mm -hmm. back to California. Fine, I'll do it. <laughs> All right, I'll move out to Cal California, but it's, it's a place that on the beach that we both love, and we did, and, and we we did that. We found a place, and um, man, I fell fell more in love than I ever could have dreamed. And folks, this is what I want you to understand: like I'm I'm 54. Rosie and I, I know she don't look it, but we're both in our 50s. <laughs> it's never too late to find love, and you know, it's, I think we're giving yeah. people hope. Yeah. Yeah, right. That true. It is never too late. And I've absolutely never had a love this deep. I've never been cared for this deeply. I've never, um, I've never just been able to just be with someone without worrying until I met you. Yeah, it's really, it's very like, when you find it, it's like really like unbelievable. And it's great. And so I found it with you. So <laughs> it's really cool. The, it's never too late. Never too late, <laughs> never right? Never too late, yeah. And what, what what's your feelings on all this stuff? Like you, you when I first met you, you were never, you wouldn't ever allow yourself to feel like this. What changed? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I would always, like, I wanted it, but then if it got to, um, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know if I wasn't feeling worthy of it or I would sabotage it or I would just, um, I don't know. It was, it was a, thing that I had to go through that I never allowed myself to go deeply into relationships. I was always on the surface, probably so I wouldn't get hurt. Um, and, uh, but this is the first time that I actually allowed myself to go in and get, give love and receive love and to the level that. Why, why with me? Because I, I, I think it was just meant to be. I just knew like, like you and I are like the same kind of going through the same things and you're like very vulnerable and, and like, I just knew when I met you, I was like, this is the guy I'm supposed to be with. And 
you're amazing. And I just knew it. I don't know. It's something, it's something you don't know until it happens. So. Um, and then, yeah, if, if we hadn't broken up if, again, you don't know why things happen during the time if we hadn't broken up. You wouldn't have gotten more help for yourself to yeah. open your, yeah. your heart up anymore. I wouldn't have got to do all the work I did in Thailand and with my therapist to learn more. So now we're going to tell you, kind of finish you off here with um, the, the, the high point for us was our engagement. Now everybody saw that we got engaged in Santa Monica, which is the same spot mm -hmm. where we had our first date, yeah. uh, but that actually wasn't the case and nobody knows this. <laughs> so we did it then. Um, we did it when I, we, we did it publicly when I finally got her a ring. Uh, but the truth is, so uh, again, uh, as I said, the year before I went to Thailand on a mind, body, spirit journey to really learn how to do breath work and meditation and, and heal that little kid in me. And, and I was fighting Muay Thai in the jungle, which is fantastic. Oh my God. It was the greatest thing ever. Um, with uh, my friend, Mike Swick, who fought, was the first ultimate fighter and um, owns a place out there called AKA Thailand. And another guy named Christian, who's uh, from Sweden, who's great kickboxers. Anyway, um, but it was really about the, you know, I, I didn't drink any alcohol. I only ate anti-inflammatory foods. I did breath work and meditation every day. I work with these monks as my therapists. I did all this. And I'm out there and I took a boat ride one day and I'm out in the middle of the Siam Sea in the middle, I mean, an hour and a half away from shore, in the middle of the Siam Sea. And there's this big rock in the middle there. And sun was setting and I look up and I kind of get in the water and I, I just start, start having this conversation with God. I start talking to God and having a great moment of healing and peace and some of the stuff I'm talking about of, yeah, you're, you're worthy, man. You just, you had to go through this and so you could help others through there. So it was just this beautiful moment with God where I felt, I really felt the love of the universe and I felt like it was okay. And I came back and I told Rosie about it a year later. This past year, Rosie comes with me back to the same place in Thailand called Kamalaya. And I wanted her to experience what I experienced. It was for her, but mm -hmm. I disguised it, masked it as come out there with me so you can learn these same things from these monks mm -hmm. uh, and this breath work and meditation so you can help me along with it. I take Rosie out there and she's like, tell me. Oh, I was like, the, I was like, but this is, you know. I'm doing it, but these monks aren't going to be able to relate because I was, you know, I'd lost my, my business and all this stuff. So I was like, they're not going to know what, you know, but actually <laughs> it was great. They really do. They're very like, Four minutes into yeah, their first they were like, group they're meditation. Really I turn around really and Rosie is crying <laughs> like crazy. And I'm like, ah, ah, and she's lost her mother and yeah, she's trying to deal yeah, with that. Lot, and yeah. her stores, she's, you know, yeah. she's not, you know, close those stores that were giving her problems. And it's been a lot that's gone on in her life. She's got a, her, her condo burned down twice. <laughs> Um, like, like not once, but twice. She's yeah. been through a lot yeah. in a short period, yeah. and she just starts hysterical crying. And then even these these um, these monks start helping you big time with. They're great. Yeah, they're actually like they give you like these analogies that you wouldn't like expect, but they're really good. They're very right. good. Like the monks right. are like, really great. Like you know, and, and and I think I've used it here before. We're like for a great example. Rosie was telling this monk, um, "Yeah, I just don't feel worthy of you know." Jay's love like and it was, all these, these I had so many things crappy happening. things happening right. to me like with the, just everything 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 so when the good things started happening at Jay and was like you know all these good things I felt like unworthy or like even worried that like oh god something bad's gonna happen you, you know because I was in that little that, that was your story it. that was your that racket was my story right. it was my racket I was running with so his monk says to her um Rosie what's what's your favorite food and you say the R&D chicken sandwich it's chicken sandwich <laughs> really good, and then the monk literally says you love that chicken sandwich? She said, yeah. You get great pleasure out of that chicken sandwich? Yeah. Um, when you're eating that chicken sandwich, you think anybody else thinks you shouldn't enjoy that chicken sandwich? You're not worthy of the chicken sandwich? And you said? No. <laughs> I was like, right? she goes, are, are you just enjoying, like, like what happens, you know, you get another bite of, are you worried that the person over at the other table is thinking that you're not worthy of that chicken sandwich that you're eating? 
And I was like, no. She goes, are you just enjoying your chicken sandwich until it's gone? And I was like, yeah, I'm doing the fries and stuff. And she's like, well, this is this she is said, your this your, is your life. This is your, your life with that chicken, chicken sandwich. sandwich. So enjoy it. Don't don't worry about what anybody yeah. else is like over there worried that you don't deserve that or you shouldn't have that or the fries or because you, you're not thinking that when you get your favorite meal, you're just eating it and enjoying it. She's like, that's this. Your life's the chicken sandwich. Your life is the chicken sandwich. And it changed everything for Rosie. She She literally looked at like, yeah. That's a really cool. Right. right, right. right. Nobody's against me having this. There's nothing against me. And and it changed Rosie. And it changed her so much. I saw this huge change. I take her on a boat ride. And totally different boat company, totally different place, everything. And all of a sudden, we're getting the sunset. And I look, we come over these rocks and I look over and I go, oh my God, we're at the same exact spot I was at last year when I was having that talk with God. Oh my God. I never thought I'd see that place again. Oh my God. I said, baby, this is the place I told you about. This is the place. This is where I told you I had that talk with God. She's like, well, it's literally in the middle of the Siam Sea. And this like rock comes up. There could be any other place we could have been. A different boat company. We're in the same exact place place and i turn to rosie and i said baby i promise you i'll always love you admire you appreciate you most of all i will always take care of you and love you i guess i'm asking you to marry me <laughs> and she says what well, uh, well, well, well are you and i go uh uh yeah 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 i am i am i'm gonna ask you to marry me like i wasn't expecting it but it's the same way right. I, I was like oh what and yeah, she says I said yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, I didn't have a ring, so we had uh, the, we had cutlery, and there was a string around the cutlery. So I pulled the string off the cutlery, mm-hmm. and I put that on her finger, and she wore that for a couple of weeks without anybody knowing that we were engaged. We didn't tell anybody. She had this little piece of string around her finger. <laughs> I'm not going to show off that we I got uh, engaged to Rosie with a little piece of string on her finger. I'm going to look like the cheapest bastard who ever lived. <laughs> So it really wasn't until we went out, we went ring shopping, we did it all, and we got a ring. And then I said, let's go back to the original spot of our first date. And I got down on my knee and I did a proper engagement. That's when the world found out that we were engaged, but we were actually engaged for for two weeks earlier. But it was a beautiful engagement and one that could only happen like once in a lifetime. And once in a lifetime. Really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And you're really amazing too. So uh, thank you, baby. (laughs) Uh, Again, this is, you know, I, I hope we've given people hope. I hope we've given people the ability to say, wow, there, there is, it, it is never too late. And also know that by Rosie Stewart, it's never too late to reinvent yourself. It's never too late to make a change, yeah. right? And I hope we've also taught more than anything with your partner, lean into them and make sure they know, I got you. I'm not going anywhere. I got you. And really make them understand. And then the other thing that Rosie and I really do, right? Some of our lessons I am very vocal to Rosie about what I need. Baby, I need you to hear this. This is what I need from you. And you listen. And same thing. She will come to me and say, hey, I'm really uncomfortable with this. Jay, I need I need you to hear me on this. This is what I need from you. So be very vocal. I, we hear a lot of couples say, yeah, he's not going to understand. Yeah, he's not going to listen. Yeah, she won't understand me. You don't know that until you actually sit down and tell them, hey, I really need you to hear me here. I'm in a lot of pain. And we've had uh, somebody that we knew who was, hey, one of the most beautiful women we've ever seen in our lives, um, basically tell us she was about to kill herself. And she's in a happily married relationship. And I said, he needs to understand your pain. And she said, he won't. I said, well, he needs to. You deserve that. And we called him over and said, hey, man, you need to read the third chapter of my book that that lays out this is what it feels like to have this anxiety and this depression, what it feels like and what it feels like inside, just so you understand her, because, man, you deserve to understand her, and she deserves for you to be her best teammate. And yeah. he, at that t- time, said, oh, I didn't realize it was this bad. O- okay, and did, and, you know, they're great. But really, a lot of times our people we're closest to we hold the most things back from give them the grace of being your best friend give them the grace of being your teammate really tell them everything you're going through 
And don't say, oh, I don't want to put more on them. No, that's what marriage is about. That's what relationships are about. So you have the ultimate teammate walking this walk together with you. that's great i love that so maybe i loved having you on i love showing you to the world it was fun it's been fantastic is there anything else you want to add if something you've learned from us or um i just think that the communication is really like our communication this the second go around is much better so like that's the best thing that we give each other is like now we're communicating and making sure that we're like make sure the other one knows like right. like what you just said yeah so it's it's amazing it's been really good and, and i want you to know also like i've had a lot of meltdowns to you has it ever gotten too much no no right. it's no but but if it does then you know you just take a little like you know get a little moment and then come back and reset but no it's like right. I, yeah but my point is people think oh it's gonna be too much and this other person's gonna leave Right? No, no, no. Yeah, right. no. Yeah, that's that's it. You just have to reassure them and reassure them, reassure yes. them and, and you know, reassure them because that's right. the we've been on and off for get together now for three years and she still reassures me yeah. and she may have to for the rest of her life. And the meltdowns are like, part of it. Like so they make you grow. They make you grow closer because you can make it through it because like right. sometimes there are people are fearful. Like if this happens, the person's going to break up with you or it's going to end the thing. But but like bumpy roads just make you stronger. And if your relationship's not strong enough to make it through these bumpy roads, then it's not that strong of a relationship. And it's not strong enough yeah. to make it to, through the storms of life. Through the storm, yeah. Right. So it's like if, if start with the bumpy roads yeah. and then make sure you get through those, so you could together, yeah, hold each other's hands, yeah, and get through the storms of life. Nobody more than I'd rather go through these storms of life Aww. with from you. Thank you, babe. Thank you, Aww. everybody. <laughs> that is my beautiful fiance, Rosie Tennyson. Uh, one half of the Tennyson twins, the better half. No, Renee, I'll kill me. Better clean that up. Better clean that up. But but also, I did the the great part for me is I do get a sister. Yeah, you do. Renee you has do. been and amazing. Really close, which She's is nice. been fantastic. And it's one great. thing you do is you don't get between two nope. twins. Nope. You make sure that you foster that relationship more yeah. and more and more because yeah. they started in the womb. Yeah. And you two are survivors. Yeah. Again, yeah. I, and you're survivors. And you've you survived yeah. that place in Idaho yeah. and these journeys and all these, yeah. you guys are survivors. Yeah. You're the American dream and you're my dream. Oh, thank you, baby. I love you, love baby. You. Love you too. Folks, this was the best guest I've ever had in Unbreakable. <laughs> hope you enjoy it over the holidays. I hope we have given you all some hope and some lessons for you all to walk this walk.